పూజేస్వామి ప్రకాశానంద పండిత రాంప్రసాద్ పాషా పండిత రవి భారతి లేడీస్ అండ్ జెంటల్మెన్ స్వాగతం అండ్ వెల్కమ్ టు దిస్ ప్రోగ్రామ్ organized by the International Day of Yoga Committee, Sri Narayan Tobago. In the year 2015, when the newly elected Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, proposed to the United Nations that there should be an International Day of Yoga, although he was in office just for a couple of months at that time, the nations of the united nations unanimously supported his motion and june 21st was adopted as international day of yoga and uh, since that time we in trinidad felt that there was a need to commemorate there was a need to recognize this momentous uh, occasion for although um, yoga was around for thousands and thousands of years um in our civilization it was been appropriated in many forms outside of india and in the west it was taking a direction of its own without the acknowledgement of the source of yoga so it presented us an opportunity throughout the world and here in Trinidad and Tobago for us to be able to bring groups together who were involved in the practice of yoga and uh, who had an interest in yoga and it included not only the, um, the temples and the traditional yoga charyas but we made attempts to build bridges with all the yoga studios in Trinidad and Tobago and the International Day of Yoga Committee was formed So this is our fourth year and um, we have had a couple events thus far that most of you have supported but one of the mandates of the yoga committee our mandate was really to present yoga not only as asana so it was yoga beyond the asana in addition to the asana and the more popular forms of hatha yoga that has been popularized outside of india so if we are to look at yoga outside the realms of predominant uh, popular practice of hatha yoga um i guess we could look at the patanjali yoga sutras in which the whole science of yoga is well um, is well laid out in the sutras of patanjali and over the thousands of years you know exponents have been exploring the dimensions of yoga under patanjali's yoga sutra but then for this year when we were thinking about having a lecture because lecture series or all lectures part of a deliberate decision that we had made that we must include in the calendar events for international day of yoga and uh, we said that we would like to look at the yoga of the bhagavad gita because in the bhagavad gita at the end of every chapter we are very familiar with the closing iti shri mad bhagavad gita so upanishad so in the upanishad of the bhagavad gita so bhagavad gita is upanishad brahma vidyayam knowledge of brahman yoga shastri shri krishna arjuna samvadi shri krishna arjuna samvadi the dialogue between lord krishna and arjuna and very importantly yoga shastri now there are many commentaries on bhagavad gita many interpretations but to look at bhagavad gita as yoga shastri as a yoga shastra is probably as not as prevalent as the other commentaries that view it in the context of the upanishad 
and as the knowledge of Brahma, Brahma Vidya Yam. So we felt that within that Yoga Shastri, and the fact that every chapter of Bhagavad Gita is referred to as a yoga, even the first chapter that deals with the Vishada of Arjuna, the distress or the despondency of the confusion of Arjuna, is referred to as Arjuna Vishada Yoga. So every chapter is referred to as yoga. So we decided that we are going to explore this in a bit more detail and we are exceedingly fortunate. We are very blessed and we are very honored and privileged to be able to have Pooja Swami Prakashananda here with us to explore this topic with us. You know, um, I said exceedingly fortunate because since 2015 when Yoga Day was declared, uh, International Day of Yoga was declared, it so happened that coincidentally every year since then, Swamiji was out of the country. <laughs> so he got caught this year. <laughs> And uh, we wasted absolutely no time when we knew he was available to ask him to spend some time with us this afternoon. Swamiji, as we know, is the spiritual head of the Chinmaya Mission of Trinidad and Tobago. And um, as we reflect on the history of our forefathers, they came to this land and look at the um, propagation of Sanatana Dharma. As a son of the soil, you know, it really fills us with, um, with good pride. <laughs> Not a negative type, but it fills us with, it fills us with, a, a source, with emotions and good feelings and everything to know of the, um, of the, the impact that Swami Prakashananda has, have here, has had here in Trinidad and uh, now in the Western Hemisphere. He is, despite his um, height, he is a, what we refer to as a giant, a spiritual giant that this soil has produced. And um, Swamiji, we look forward to your, so your discourse. What we are going to do is to ask Swamiji to address us, give his discourse for about uh, an hour, and uh, then we would have a question and answer session until we close. Overall, we are hoping to finish at 8.30. All right, so I hand you over to Pujya Siswami Prakashananda. Kratunda Mahakai Surya Koti Samaprabha Nirvignam Kurume Deva Sarvakari Shusavata Saraswati Namastubhyam Varade Kam Rupini Vidya Rambam Karishyami Siddhir Bhavatu Me Sada Guru Brahma Guru Vishnu Guru Devo Maheshwaraha Guru Sakshat Param Brahma Tasmai Shri Gurave Om Parthaya Pratibhotitam Bhagavata Narayane Naswayam Vyasena Gratitam Purana Munina Madhye Mahabharatam Advaitam Ritavarishinim Bhagavati 
ಅಷ್ಟಾದಶಾಧ್ಯಾಯಿನೀ ಅಂಬತ್ವಾಮನುಸಂಧಾಮಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತೆ ಭವದ್ವೇಷಿಣಿ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತೆ ಭವದ್ವೇಷಿಣಿ thank you dev ji for that introduction and a very special hari om and welcome to all of you the topic that was given is yoga of the bhagavad gita well it is a good thing it came because i have been doing gita for so many years but i never did this topic yoga of the bhagavad gita now just let me tell you a few things before we proceed there one is bhagavad gita does not talk about yoga asanas you know all there is no such thing in in bhagavad gita huh? yoga asanas are not there in bhagavad gita no instructions about yoga asanas people think many things are there in bhagavad gita which are not there every day i see a lot of things being quoted and say it comes from gita but it is not there that is a normal thing that is okay one parent came to the school and told swami ji show this boy show him show him show him where it says in bhagavad gita he should not smoke <laughs> gita doesn't have all this thing please be uh, careful now i just want to tell you so there will be no such thing as asanas and all that sort of thing in gita there is no structured program as structured as patanjali ji gave in his yoga sutras so the yoga which is being spoken about in bhagavad gita then is of some different sort this is the first thing patanjali ji gave yama uh, yama niyama ityadi ha pranayam pratyahar dharana dhyan samadhi and all of this really well structured system that you have to follow in stages which of course people pay only attention to that asana niyama niyama asana that third one people pay attention to that only but it is really a eight fold system and that is like if you go to the restaurant and there is dal and rice and sabji and chapati and you know dessert and you only eat the chapati and come home that also not good and who will go to a restaurant in a buffet there and you only eat dry chapati and come home you have to take the any smart buffet <laughs> so anyway there are there are eight steps it's called ashtanga yoga ashtanga yoga means there eight steps are there so please follow through all of those who are practicing patanjali yoga seek the others but no bhagavad gita yoga is something else now let me tell you what that is huh? yoga word first yoga in sanskrit comes from the sanskrit root yuj in the seven conjugation means to unite yuj means to unite now first of all if you are going to unite there has to be two more than one thing because one thing cannot unite with one thing you have to have two things or more to unite so yoga really means unification if you put the simple meaning yoga yoga means unification ah <coughs> no uniting what with what if we start thinking about this then we'll realize that the teaching of bhagavad gita has to be the broad teaching of bhagavad gita has to be understood very very clearly first then we will know uniting what with what now see here at many places in bhagavad gita even in tulsi ramayan you will see tulsi das you will say for instance si ram me sab jag jani this whole world is ram everything is ram you see i see gati gati ram basa hai tum kabhi das ye sir ram is there in everything in bhagavad gita bhagwan shri krishna says vasudeva sarvamiti all this is vasudeva vasudeva is everything 
मया तथमिद जगदव्यक्त मूर्तिना आई पवेल यू होल यूनिवर्स सो दि टीचिंग ऑफ भगवद गीता इज दिस फर्स्ट थिंग वॉट दे इज नथिंग एक्सेप्ट दि एब्सोलूट रियालिटी इज कॉल गॉड ब्रह्मन राम कृष्ण वॉट एवर यू वॉन्ट टू कॉल वासुदेव वॉट एवर नेम यू वॉन्ट टू कॉल द थिंग एक्सिस्टेंस सचित दि यूनिवर्स इज मेड अप ऑफ दैट वन रियालिटी दिस इज दि फर्स्ट thing that one has to understand no if there is one second question will come if there is only one thing which makes up all of this where does the question of yoga come they know yoga but one cannot unite with one well let me tell you a story and then you will see how one will unite with one one there was a fellow who somehow by some psychological defect started thinking of himself as a mouse he thought that he was a mouse and you know when a mouse sees a cat what happens so his wife had to be really careful with him to make sure that there are no cats around the house and she had to make sure that she doesn't take him anywhere where there may possibly be any cat because the moment he saw a cat he used to scream and run and lock himself in some room so the wife couldn't bear this anymore because it was happening over and over you can't avoid all cats especially in the, you know a place where you know cats run so anyway she took him to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist decided look better leave him here for one week <coughs> i'll take care of him and after a week you come then we'll see how he's doing so she left him there and the psychiatrist put him in a room with a little hole only to give him food and told look here you you are a man you are not a mouse and he put a recording inside that room with him kept on saying you are a man you are not a mouse and left him in that room for one week <clears throat> after one week the wife came both of them went to that room and then uh, they said let's see how he's doing open the doctor asked him You learned? Yes, I learned. What did you learn? I learned you are a man. You are not a mouse. So the doctor realized that I he put the wrong recording there. He should put that recording. I am a man. I am not a mouse. So to let why you go. One week again you leave him. Then he changed that recording. Kept him there for another week. and again the wife came after that week and then both of them went let's see how we doing open the door there you learned yes i learned what did you learn i am a man i am not a mouse are wa badi baat hai the wife happy and the doctor happy too the wife paid the doctor and everything and they left after going out in the parking lot there he saw a cat and he ran right back into the doctor's office and ran and sat on the table and the wife came running after and the doctor what happened she said well as soon as he went out he saw a cat and he ran back in here the doctor asked him what is the matter with you didn't you tell me you learned he said yes i learned what did you learn i learned that i am a man i am not a mouse then why did you run when you saw that cat he said i know i am a man does the cat know that i am a man we don't know if the cat knows this sort of psychological possibility is a real possibility yeah it is a real thing actually the human mind is capable of multifarious things and we have seen many many movies and all all that i remember in childhood i saw one movie called raja aur rank you remember two princes were born in the, in the palace and their uh, midwife 
took one of the prints to some village somewhere or gave it the baby away to some and that prince was brought, brought up there. Now, even though he's a prince by birth, his whole life he's thinking he's a pauper. So he's one thing but thinking he is something else. Is that possible or not? The teaching of the Upanishad and the teaching of Bhagavad Gita is this very same thing. And if you go on, all of us go on singing every day you sing. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham You chant, na? My nature is Chidananda Rupa. But there is a psychological defect in the mind caused by maya which makes me feel that I am finite, I am limited, I am subject to death, I make me feel all of the things which bring fear and so many things. And that is maya at work through the mind. The mind is the mirror through which maya reflects and brings all of these thoughts of finitude and all of that to us. I went the fir from the first thought to the second to the third and all the way down, calm, growth, mother, love, fear, anger, greed, all the things coming down, we are all suffering. And we identify with this body, mind, intellect. I am this body, I am the mind, I am the intellect. And this Chidananda Rupa, that is only good for bhajan. <laughs> Chidananda Rupa is only good for bhajan. Bhagwan Sri Krishna is faced with an Arjuna whose psychology had taken him to a point of crisis. He had nothing less than an existential crisis. Arjuna. And Bhagwan realized very soon that the only rectification for this crisis is Atma Jnana. You, we may try, Atma Jnana means Arjuna should realize himself. He should really realize that I am Satchit Ananda. Every other solution is a piecemeal solution. You know, like today, modern medicine? Modern medicine doesn't have any interest in really curing you. Eh? Modern medicine wants to make sure that you come again and, and again and keep buying pills. Otherwise, all the pharmaceutical companies will. You have to come, keep buying. So, every solution in spirituality is a piecemeal solution until one discovers one's innate intrinsic nature of Sat Chit Ananda. Now, where does the word yoga come in that? Yoga, I told you, is uniting of two things. So there is a being who is actually Sat Chit Ananda, who is thinking himself to be body, mind and intellect. In fact, in truth, he is Satchitananda by nature, intrinsically, but he has taken himself, just like the man has taken himself to be a mouse, or the, 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 the prince has taken himself to be a pauper. The human being has taken himself to be this body, mind, and intellect. And body, mind, and intellect, they are all are finite. So he takes himself to be a finite being. Body, mind, and intellect are subject to birth and death, shadvikar, growth, decay, and all such things. So, because he has identified with the body, mind, intellect, which are undergoing all of these death and decay and all such things, he feels, I am going to die. He feels, I am going to uh, suffer. He feels all of these things, whatever the body, mind, and intellect goes through. So, the idea is that being who has identified himself wrongly has to now re identify himself rightly. That re identifying, I mean, relinquishing identification with the BMI and once more re-establishing his identification with Satchit Ananda. That is yoga what we are talking about in Bhagavad Gita. Now, it is also called as Praptasya Prapti. Praptasya Prapti means this, you really cannot unite with yourself because you are already that. Isn't it? If I am already Satchit Ananda, how I will unite with myself? I am already Satchit Ananda. 
So it's just a matter of, very simply now, proper understanding. The yoga then is a matter of proper understanding. I am not this body, mind, and intellect. I am Sat Chit Ananda. Now, that understanding, for that understanding to come, a long process has to take place. You see this fellow with the mouse thing, only one week he put him there, right? Only one week he put him inside there. But here, one has to enter into a long process of self-rehabilitation. Rehabilitating a mind that has for countless lifetimes taught itself to be finite, taught itself to be body, mind, and intellect. That rehabilitation requires a very structured program. And that is what Bhagavad Gita provides. A structured program for the rehabilitation of that individual jiva to make him once more realize his tr true essential nature. And it is a program which is different from the Patanjali yoga program, which also is meant to do one and the same thing. They don't have different goals. Dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Samadhi in Patanjali yoga system, that samadhi is to realize one's oneness with the absolute reality. Same thing. It's not different. But here, there's one program there, and there's one program. Here, people go through all sorts of programs, different type of programs. So, and, and Hinduism is wonderful like that. Why is it wonderful? It's buffet style. <laughs> you don't like this yoga, you try that yoga. You don't like that yoga, try that. Other yoga, so many types of yoga. And every day is multiplying also. It's a wonderful thing. So, the program which is there in Bhagavad Gita is meant to unite that jiva with his true self. And the unification it cannot be a physical unification because I am not physically separated from reality. You think how you cannot be separated from God. It's not possible. When he says, Vasudeva Sarvamiti, Vasudeva is all of this. That means the Lord, Tulsi Daji also, Hari Vyapaka Sarvatra Samana. Hari pervades every single thing. If he pervades every single thing, that means he pervades every iota of your being or not. If he pervades every iota of your being, how are you separate from Hari? Maya tatam idam zarvam. I pervade everything, he says in Gita. Then how is he separate from me? He's not. We have never been separate. One has never been separate from the reality and one cannot be separate from the reality. If you have to be separate from God, you will have to go somewhere where God is not. And then if you can ever do that, go somewhere where God is not, that means to say, God is not all pervasive. Sahi ki nahi? Correct or not? If you can ever get out of God, Surdas, the one told Bhagavan Sri Krishna, Surdas, you know, blind fellow. He used to go, Krishna, 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 like that. Bhagavan Sri Krishna came to play with Surdas. Because the Lord likes to play with his devotees. And he came there. Bhagavan Shri, Surdas grabbed for him and Krishna jumped back. So, Bhagavan said, Surdas, how did you know I was here? He said, hey, Prabhu, a simple thing. I heard the anklets of Radha. If that anklet said, that means you are here somewhere. So anyway, he jumped. And again, Sudhas tried to grab. And again, Krishna jumped back. And two, three times like that, Sudhas said, take hey, He sat down. Hey, Prabhu, you jump. You're running away from me. But I challenge you, let me see you get out of my heart. Bhagavan cannot. We, Bhagavan, we cannot get out of the Lord and the Lord cannot get out of us because of the all-pervasiveness of that Lord or the reality. 
All pervasiveness means that it pervades every iota of every single thing. That means he pervades every iota of my being. And the extension of that means he is me. Now, if our intellect has not yet evolved to appreciate this esoteric concept, it is still the goal of a Hindu. This is what I'm telling you, is only in Hinduism you'll find it. Eh? That God pervades every iota of my being, and the logical extension of that is God is me. I am God. This may sound blasphemous in other religions and all, but this is the reality. Like the wave can say, I am ocean. Why? Because ocean is made up of H2O, and wave is made up of H2O. In that sense, the essence is one and same. So, <coughs> that jiva, who is in fact an intrude Satchitananda, is taking himself to be a finite being with a body, mind, and intellect. And he has to now rehabilitate himself and merge back. Psychologically, not physically, he's already one. Now, that program which is laid out in Bhagavad Gita for this, to effect this result, that program in Bhagavad Gita is called Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and Jnana Yoga. There's something to do. So that practice of karma in such a way that it will bring this jiva closer to his true self, that practice using the body is called a karma yoga. That practice using the heart, again to bring the jiva closer even, that is called as bhakti yoga. And that practice using the intellect to bring that jiva even closer to himself, that is called as jnana yoga. You understand these three things? This is using the body, using the heart, and using the intellect. Because these are the three main faculties in the human being. So using that body in the proper way so that it will bring him closer to a re-identification with his true nature, using that body properly, that is told in the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, Karma Yoga. Otherwise, our body is used only for enjoyment. And then using the heart, the emotional faculty. This is the physical faculty, the body. Heart is emotional. Then the intellect is the intellectual faculty, the head, intellectual faculty. Using all of them to take us in the direction of re-identifying with our true self, true nature. And since it is used in that effort of reunification of me with my own self, that is called as karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga. You understand why I think it's called a yoga now? And it's, it's, it, it is a very interesting part because it is to unite something with itself, which is all, it is already united with. But you see the man, how far is the, the, the man from himself, the man who thinks he's a mouse? How far is that pauper from the prince? There is no distance, isn't it? There is no distance from the, between the pauper and the prince. The pauper is the prince. So now, very briefly, all I have left to tell you then is these three yogas, because the topic is yoga of Bhagavad Gita. These three yogas, which, is, which are there in these 18 chapters. So the first one is called as karma yoga. Karma yoga is, like I said, the human being has three faculties. And these three faculties have to be used. We do, we do not, Bhagavad Gita doesn't envisage any lopsided development in a human being. You know, all the faculties have to be, I mean, you can't, you can't just go on lifting dumbbells alone and, and, and put strength in your arms, muscles and all, and your leg has no strength. You will not be able to stand how you stand to lift the dumbbell. There has to be total all round development. So we have identified the three parts of the personality, the physical part, the emotional part, and 
the intellectual part, in the head, head, heart and body. So now, first one, all of us are acting, working, going on doing all day, up and down. You know, some people are workaholics, hmm? can't stop, can't sit properly, quietly, they're gone all day. So by, um, um, Gita chapter also tells, we cannot sit for a moment also without doing something. We go on. Okay, take hai. If you are so, now so bound to do work, why don't you do the work in such a way that it brings some benefit? So the benefit which is emphasized in Karma Yoga is called as Chitta Shuddhi. Now please see, I started by telling you the defect is a psychological defect, correct? It has something only wrong in our understanding. There is nothing else wrong. It is only wrong in understanding. There is nothing wrong with that man is a very healthy man who thinks he's a mouse. He's a very healthy man. There is only something wrong in his mind. So here, there is something wrong in our mind. And that mind has to be rehabilitated. So, he said, first, you know when, when Bhagwan Ram goes to fight Ravan in Lanka? That time, all the foot soldiers, what they call infantry, all the people in the front, right? First, you have to remove all of them. Akshay Kumar first was removed, remove all his foot soldiers. Then they had to uh, remove uh, Kumbhakarana, then Meghnath. Ravan is the last one to be removed. You have to remove all the fellows in front first before you can get to Ravan. Correct or not? Well, the same approach is used here also in the Bhagavad Gita. We have all the impurities in our mind. What impurities? That we encounter on a daily basis. They're called mala in Sanskrit. Kama, krodh, madhala means anger, jealousy, hatred, pride, this, that, every day that we meet. You know, people on edge, everybody... Especially when you're driving to work in the morning to Port of Spain. You know what I'm talking about. And if it is in America and all, you send the pitch a little bit more. Up, and so therefore you have things like road rage and all kind of... So these are called all mala. The, the regular impurities that you know on a daily basis. You know, all the backstabbing and backbiting and this thing going on in the office and that. How I know? Everybody tell me how I must know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the regular... Every day thing, you know, the little cheating and stealing and this and all. What we call impurities of the mind. Hmm? One fellow met a, one of his friends on the road, on the street. That friend used to be, write, um, uh, what do you call that thing? Um, novels. He used to write novels. Um, make up stories and write. Hmm? Um, Fiction novels, huh? Fiction novels, not non-fiction. Fiction novels. So he asked him, so what is your latest fiction? He says, my income tax return. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, latest fiction. Now, see, this is the result of all sorts of impurities in the mind of the regular, normal impurities. The second class of impurity is called as vikshepa. Vikshepa means... <coughs> You, look, you may not be having any of these regular... I, I might be a person who gets angry and who has hatred for anybody or malice or any such... You know, all of those type of things. But my mind has a natural tendency to flutter and run and go wild and can't sit quietly. If I sit here... You try it, you'll know. The moment you sit for um, um, japa, take your mala and you sit there for japa. Om Shri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram, whatever you are chanting. Om Namah Shivai, Om Namah Shivai. Are they by the fourth bead? Your mind is gone to Australia. <laughs> the whole mala done, then you realize, are they? You finish? <laughs> huh? They're called Vikshepa. No, you're not a bad person or anything. You don't have any impurities in your mind. You don't hate this one or get angry with that. But this Vikshepa, the, the natural tendency of the mind to, to go away, you cannot sit quietly. Called Vikshepa. And the last one, impurity, is called as avarana. Avarana means, 
my true nature is really and truly veiled from me. I mean veiling. My true nature is veiled from me. I am Satchitananda, but I am thinking myself to be body, mind, intellect. So my true nature is veiled. So there are three levels of impurities. One is the regular, everyday, calm, crude, anger, and jealousy, and pride, and all that kind of thing. The other one is the natural vic shape of the mind, or the agitations of the mind, and it's habit to run away everywhere. And the last is the veiling of my true nature. These three have to be removed by these three. Karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga, which is dealt with in, in succession in the first six chapters, the next six, and the last six. So, in that first six, where karma yoga is, it's there to remove, it's chittasya shuddhaye karma, it is said. Karma is there for purifying the mind. You, Bhagavan is telling Arjuna, my dear Arjuna, you get up and do your duty. If I, what a simple thing, right? But, now we are saying, everybody does do their duty. Everyone does his own duty. But karma yoga is not a matter simply of doing your duty. Karma yoga entails a few more little things. Huh? Then it becomes karma yoga. We, otherwise, it just becomes karma. Everybody doing their karma. Every day we are going and doing our work, whatever we are doing, taking care of our children, taking care of the household, going to our job, getting salary, coming back, you know, doing, paying our dues and this and that. It's karma only. It's not karma yoga. So, what exactly then is karma yoga? Bhagavan says, Loka sangraha me vapi sampashyan kartu marasi. My dear Arjuna, you, whatever duty work you are doing, you have to see that thing in the right context. Asakto hyacharan karma means to say you have to do your work also with no attachment to the result. Now, throughout the scriptures, everywhere, this karma yoga principle is given, eh? but best given in Bhagavad Gita. First thing, get up and do your duty. Second thing, ma phal hetur bhuhu. So this very famous line in second chapter, karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana means to say I have the power, prerogative, privilege to do my duty. But what result will come? We say I leave it up to Bhagwan. I get up and I do my duty conscientiously. I do my duty to the best of my ability and let the result be in his hands. Well, if this thing is fulfilled, then it becomes karma yoga. But, but nobody thinks are like this. Every day we get up and we see how to beat the competition and to edge that one out and to edge the other one out. Nobody goes, Prabhu, I'm going to do my work and I leave it up to you. You decide what will happen. I'm just going to get up and do my work today. For your sake. We get very much attached to all our things around us and we only do with those things in mind. We have to broaden our understanding and our vision. I'm doing it for the Lord of the universe, the Lord who has manifested as this universe and who is responsible for my present existence. Huh? I was explaining to my class just a couple of days ago. It takes a universe to make this thing happen. It takes an entire universe to make this. You don't think it's just one watchmaker who has made it. The entire universe went into making this. No, 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 no. It's just a piece of plastic. It's just a piece of plastic. Plastic came from petroleum. So it's just the petroleum and one man made it. How the petroleum came out? How the petroleum came out from under the earth? Well, a big multinational corporation took it out. So if the corporation was not there, then how many people are working for that corporation? Then how the, plastic, how the petroleum was formed under the earth? You could think. If you start thinking all the things that went into making this, you'll realize the entire universe was required for this thing. Based on that, I have found myself here for which an entire universe is responsible. And therefore, I owe this 
existence to the universe. Because of that, I now have to work and do my little bit and offer it back to the universe. This is the essence of karma yoga. Whatever work I am doing, I, universe means Ishwara, the Lord. Ishwara, Arpana, Buddhi. I go on doing my work, my dear Arjuna, you look towards the benefit of humanity and do your duty. So in that, in that karma yoga, few things are involved there. One is, first you do your duty, second, offer it back to Bhagwan. What, third, whatever the result comes, that prasad buddhi means I accept it. Bhagwan willed it like that. Whatever result I had in mind didn't come, but the Lord wanted it like that. They call prasad buddhi. A non insistence on, and strong insistence on some result. That, and you know that when we insist on something and we don't get it, which is half of the time we will not get it. And if you're really bad lucky, most of the time you will not get it. <laughs> then what terrible uh, disappointment in the mind. Wherever there's appointment, there will be disappointment. So, this is the essence of karma yoga. Bhakti yoga is what? Look here, all of us have an ample supply of love, you know. We have an ample supply of love. Look here. We love like anything. The other problem is we invested our love in the wrong place. <laughs> and quite often the market crashes. <laughs> we invent our love in all the wrong places. Correct or not? Mm? I love my shoes. I love my car. I love my house. I love my children. I love the dog. I love everything around me. And they will crash. The market crashed today also. All these stock exchanges across the globe today crashed again. We invest our love in so many things around that things that are personally connected to, that is the problem. It is not investing in things around. We ha if we invest the love in things around, we have to invest the love in a, in a fair manner. I love all things equally, but that is our problem. Yeah, if I have one ice cream cone and my son is and the neighbor's son they're playing inside my house and I only have one ice cream cone, I wait till the neighbor's son go home. <laughs> so then I give the ice cream cone to my son. You see? So I love only my son. I don't care about neighbor's son and all that kind of thing. So our love is invested like that in what personal things. This is not Bhakti, eh? that is why I call love only. That is why people fall in love. It's a big fall. <laughs> Bhakti is about rising in, in love. In the Western world, everybody only fall in love. So now, to withdraw my love, the investments of love which I have made in all personal things, and to open my heart and embrace this most vast and wondrous, stupendous, amazing manifestation of that reality, which such a variety that proliferates in avenues unfathomable by our mind, to invest that love in that type of reality, that thing is called as bhakti. So where is the requirement and where are we that everybody has to do for him? Self. Where am I and what is the requirement of bhakti? Devotion to that reality that pervades every iota of every being. Where is that person who gets up in the morning and, ah, Prabhu, what a wonderful manifested universe you have, you have here and what a wonderful thing is it, it is that I am part of it. You are so amazing. I, you blow my mind. We get up and put on the news only and watch the morning show. <laughs> and get depressed and go to work. <laughs> mm. It means to say, where am I? And where I have to? To be. Uh, I'm telling in the eighth chapter. Purusha Saparapartha Bhakti Labhyas Tvanyaya Bhaktya by, by 
unflinching devotion to that Lord, we can reach him. It means we can come to our own self. Like that. So, in bhakti yoga, what is just required is I pull my love from personal selfish things and expand it to, to all. There may be, it's not there in Bhagavad Gita, but in other shastras is there. There may be the requirement that temporarily I take a murti of Bhagavan, a mantra of Bhagavan. That is to bring some focus and attention to the mind. And I first do worship and I learn to collect the fragmented rays of my love through that process. So that may be required at a certain stage. Certain stage. Everybody's different. So this bhakti yoga is there from chapter 7 to 12. That is the intervening six chapters. And it is meant, like I said, to use the emotional faculty to get attracted and attached to a the vast being of the universe. Otherwise, we are attached only to our little things, finite things, but we want to get closer to the infinite. This bhakti yoga removes all the agitations and the vikshepa of the mind. The mind has having this tendency to run here and run there. You know that. I tell you, anytime you love something in this world, you'll see how quickly your mind will get chitta ekagata, I mean single pointedness. Hmm? That young fella, he, he driving his hard sports car inside his whole village and terrorizing everybody. Then, suddenly he falls in love. And on his screensaver, he has his beloved there. When he comes to the traffic light. <laughs> the thing turned green and he's still watching here. Everybody had a blow horn from behind. Chitta eka grata, his mind has become single pointed. That thing has become like that. We forget all the whole traffic and everything. Love has that ability. Anytime we love something, if a person falls in love with anything, becomes passionate about anything, his mind only stays on that thing. So that bhakti yoga is using the heart to bring myself closer towards my true nature, towards the infinite reality. And last is jnana yoga with Tulsi Daji. Very rightly says it's very difficult. It's in Ramayana a number of times. It is very difficult, this Jnana Yoga, because it requires a lot of intellectual application. One has, to go on, one has to go on reflecting, contemplating, thinking over and over and over again, and then finally sit down and meditate. Jnana Yoga, the intellect. So this starts from chapter 13 until the end. And in Jnana Yoga, the thinking has to take one in the direction of eliminating all things as mithya. It's called mithya jnana. All the things that we know, it, is, it only appears like that. It is not like that. This is jnana yoga. It appears to us like that. Like, for example, even physics is telling now this thing, it looks like something solid. But if you really put it under an electron microscope, it disappears you will see 99.99% space. But how is it looking for solid? Well, you see it like that. That doesn't mean to say it is solid. Science also is telling this thing. So it's an appearance. The world before us is an appearance. And it is really not as it appears. The world is nothing but existence, really. So in Gyan Yoga, this is what is taught in the last. And in that now, if everything is existence, so where there is good and bad, where there is dharma and adharma. Well, Jnana Yoga is about this type of thinking, very, very, very esoteric, very demanding, and sometimes people get scared. There is no such thing as dharma. So Bhagavan himself, sarva dharma parityajya. You drop all dharma also. Mamekam sharanam vraja. Take refuge in me. But all the time you were telling me to follow dharma. 
No, no, I told like that, but now you will leave all them. You come here. Or in, in second chapter, Sukha Dukhe Same Kritwa. You become balanced between Sukha and Dukha. You should not pay attention to the Sukha or Dukha means joy or sorry. You remain equipoised. So like this, using the intellect to understand that there has to be only one reality. If there are two, one will limit the other. There's only one reality. You can't have two. And, and the, the religion which actually teaches this is Hinduism. The two is an impossibility. There can be appearance of two. But for there to be really two, that is an impossibility in Hinduism. There is only one thing. A fellow was playing cricket, and he, uh, he was seeing, when that bowler bowled, he was seeing two balls. Now that's trouble, isn't it? If you're playing cricket and a fast bowler coming down, like Michael Holding or somebody. I don't know who is the fast bowler today, but. <laughs> he he uh, coming out a fast ball, and when he released the ball, you see in two ball. Well, that actually happened to him. He see two balls and he fired at the wrong one. <laughs> and then he got a third ball <laughs> on his head. So, if <clears throat> there is two, then there is some trouble. That means to say, the Lord will not be infinite. Infinite requires, necessitates, there has to be only one. So that teaching is there of that oneness in the last, which is throughout Bhagavad Gita, but we're saying predominantly this type of uh, understanding is there in the last six chapters. And there, one has to go on doing mananam, reflecting on this. Oh, that means to say, the, the conclusion of all of this is what? You and I have always been one we are one now, and we will always be one. And you may not like me, but that is your problem. We are still one. <laughs> you cannot be separate from me, and I cannot be separate from you. You are my reality, and I am your reality. Hmm? So if you think you can escape from me, I also accept that I cannot escape from you. It's Everything is just made up of that one absolute supreme reality. When I have realized that, I have once more merged with myself. That I call the merging of the jiva with Ishwara. Upon that happening, both jiva and Ishwara disappear. Only Brahman remains. Absolute reality. So that is why it is called a yoga, because it is a merging I, I, you see, in English language also, how, how you really term it, you know? You're becoming one with what you already are. You see? The language actually has its own uh, shortcomings. We become, and in Sanskrit, it's told very easily, praptasya, praptasya praptihi. I gain which I already have. So that's, that is the unite. That's why I call it yoga. So I, either I do it, I start off with this, karma yoga, do all my activities in such a way, so to bring me closer, or I start off with the heart. Some people are predominantly emotional, some are predominantly active, some are predominantly intellectual. Start where you want. Like I told you, it is all nice buffet style. You start wherever you want. So this is the yoga of Bhagavad Gita. It is not the same sort of thing that you see, that we see in Patanjali, uh, yoga sutras and all. And one does not invalidate the other, or one does not preclude the other, any such thing. Both are just as good. The only thing I started with a note in the beginning about Patanjali system. Remember, that is an eightfold system. Don't get stuck only in, in one. The others are very, very, very important. Hmm? Yama and Niyama are so wonderful. Ahimsa, Satyam, Brahmacharya, Masteya, Parigraha, Ityadi, all are so, so nice. All of it has to be studied well. Eh? 
All right. Now that one hour is over. <laughs> now Dirubji told you, you will ask me some. Please don't ask me hard question. And first, if we, could, if we could stick to what I spoke about today. Let us, <laughs> I mean, let us exhaust these questions. <laughs> don't ask me anything about Yama Loka and all that. I have, I have never, you know, I don't remember. <laughs> Hari Om. Pooja Gurudev and everybody. Hari Om. My question is the question wife does ask me. If a guru can do a, teach you a mantra or touch you and make you self-realized. <laughs> she wants somebody to touch him and make him self-realized. That's what he means to say. <laughs> well, we have had... Um, we have had the live example in the tradition of uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa touching Swami Vivekananda. And also there's an incident in the life of Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi, who at one time decided to make his mother realize also, but the mother declined. So that is possible. Uh, you please remember, in an infinite Lord, with infinite manifestation, with infinite possibilities, nothing can be excluded, isn't it? By logic only. You can't exclude anything from Bhagwan. So it is very possible. Thank you. Yes. I'll give Dirubji some exercise. <laughs> Sitaram, everyone. My question is that um, you mentioned that um, it, is take, it takes a lot of effort that to erase all of the countless lifetime of us associating with the material thing. So is it that our, the vastness from our previous lifetime, it carries with us? And secondly, is that... Um, are still vague as to if we are Brahman, if everything is Brahma, then creation, what is, what is, what is creation? This is a very good question, which, is, which usually comes up in these type of discussions. It is an appearance within the, like for example, um, if really you were to eliminate all the H2O molecules from the ocean and waves, you would only remove H2O molecules and put them aside one by one. There will be no such thing as name and form of ocean nor wave. But when water is present, water has an intrinsic ability to take on the form of waves, correct or not? So an intrinsic ability to take on a form doesn't make, uh, doesn't do anything to H2O. If the H2O has taken on a form, the H2O molecule has not depreciated in any way, or nothing has gone wrong with it. It has just taken on a form. So a form does not affect the substance upon which it lies. So forms have no power to affect its fundamental substance or its adhisthana. So Brahman is the adhisthana, and all the whole universe which we are seeing are mere forms on that adhisthana. But the forms really do nothing. They can't do anything to Brahman. So the universe is just a universe of forms appearing on Brahman, which actually makes no change, which does not do anything, affect, or any such thing, Brahman. So it's appearing in Brahman. 
like waves appear in the ocean, which really doesn't do anything to H2O, like that. This direction, you have to take your mananam. Ma means, by me telling you two sentences or five sentences, it's not going to send away. Each human being has to do his own, that's called mananam, or sometimes it's called vichar. You have to go on thinking about this again and again. How it is possible that forms can appear, like all the forms appear on the screen in the movie, but it doesn't touch the screen. You know, I remember uh, when we went to see Shole, Amita Bachchan died, Bechara, blood on the screen, uh, Gabbar Singh killed him. Then everybody crying and all, in the village and all, I remember people crying. But then all that thing happened and all this happened, but what happened to the screen? The screen is an the adjust hand for the whole thing to play off, but in the end the screen is untouched. Brahman is the adjust hand of this universe. The screen is only like two dimensional, right? But Brahman is the infinite dimensional reality upon which all things play. But in the final analysis, after all is said and done, nothing is said or done. <laughs> Yes, here. <laughs> if you're loud enough, you could tell from there, you know. Everybody heard who is God, and if he has a form, where does he reside? That is the question. So, just now I was telling, see, first thing. If we understand God at the fundamental level, then it is easier to understand all the other things. This thing exists? Well, yes, it is exists. You can see it here, right? Oh, oh. This one exists? Yes. Between this one and this one, there is space, correct? The space exists? Oh, oh. That means to say everything in this universe exists, correct? Everything exists. I mean, you cannot show me something that doesn't exist. Try. Can you show me something that doesn't exist? My classic story is in the ashram, we used to have a bus. So one day we gone down south, Satsang. I used to drive the bus. When Satsang was over and we loaded up in the bus, time to come home, I look back. Is everybody here? Yes, Swamiji. All those who are missing, raise your hand. Some hands went up. <laughs> if you're raising your hand, that means you are there. I mean, if you're showing me the thing, that means that the thing exists. Show me something that doesn't exist. How oh, It's not possible, isn't it? In other words, I'll tell you now, there is no such thing as non-existence in this universe. There is only existence. This is the first point. That existence is called Sat. It is also called Chit. It is also called Ananda. Sat is a Sanskrit word for existence. So the whole universe is only existence. But that existence is not a Jara existence, an inert existence. It is a conscious existence. That Sat, which is also Chit, which is also Ananda, is called a God. Okay? It is that Sat which has the infinite capacity to appear as any number of forms, all the forms which we see in front of us, and also appears in forms of Rama and Krishna and all the different Hanuman and all the different forms which we know, and appears as different lokas, worlds, Vaikuntha and Saket Lok and Shiva Lok and Brahma Lok and all the different lokas. So when that reality takes on one of these forms, it takes on forms of ours also. But these are lesser forms because we don't know head nor tail. Isn't it? Lesser forms. But it takes on also esoteric forms, great forms, big forms, and different in, in different worlds. So that's absolute reality, which is infinite, takes on these finite forms without losing touch. When we when it takes on this form, it loses. Us. I don't know myself, I don't know God, I don't know anything. And Tulsi Dashi describes very nicely Jiva. Who doesn't know? Maya Apuna Ak. Maya is an aku kahu, jan kahiya soji, he doesn't know anything about anything. 
But when he takes on this form, he doesn't do anything. When he takes on the form of Rama, Krishna, when he takes on the form of all the avatar, then he knows. So it's existence is God, and that God takes on countless forms over a countless period of time and lives in different lokas also. Yes. Ah, there. Aryum Samiji. Samiji, we think we are this body, this mind, this mm. intellect. Mm. And, um, but we are saying that that is not our true nature. But everybody believes that. And as we say, God is all pervasive and so on and so on. What is the origin of this ignorance that is so difficult? to transcend, to overcome? Yeah, very good question. It's a pure Vedanta. So everybody forget yoga. <laughs> Vedanta is so interesting, you see? <laughs> see, the origin of ignorance is maya. First point. Hmm? Now, what is Maya? Maya is the innate intrinsic power of this infinite existence. What is the meaning of power? I'll, let me just tell you one example, and you'll try to, you have to try to conceptualize it. It's all Gyan Yoga now, we have left all the other things. So the questions are all in Gyan only. If you take a molecule of H2O under a microscope, and you look at it, huh? H2O under a microscope, you will see um, an oxygen atom to which two hydrogen atoms are attached, okay? Now, when you see that uh, basic form of one oxygen and two hydrogen attached to it, does that form under a microscope ever tell you, or can you see under the microscope the three possibilities inherent in that form, the possibility to be in a gaseous state, in a solid state, or in a liquid state. Under a microscope, can you see that? No way, isn't it? But are those three possibilities inherent in that H2O or not? Okay, first thing, the three possibilities are inherent in that H2O. Second thing, does, do those three possibilities alter or affect that H2O molecule in any way. No, they are just inherent possibilities which allow that H2O molecule to, to um, appear in any one of these three states. In the very same way, Brahman, which is the fundamental reality of the universe, H2O is the fundamental reality of the ocean. Brahman existence is the fundamental reality of the universe, which has, now, wa the water molecule only had three inherent possibilities. Now, what are the number of inherent possibilities in Brahman? Infinite, unfathomable, infinite number of possibilities. But the presence of those possibilities doesn't in any way alter Brahman. And here, our existence in this realm, in this loka, is the manifestation of just one of that infinite number of possibilities. And what is the, 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 the manifested universe we are living in? Well, one of the possibilities, there can be a jiva, and that jiva can be ignorant of his own nature. He is Satchitananda, but may not know it. And actually, that is replicated in life on a daily basis. When you go to dream, when you are sleeping on your bed, right? You are Mr. So-and-so accountant, right? In your dream, you become a bird. But in that manifestation or in your dream, you have no clue that you are an accountant, isn't it? You get wings and start flying. So you also have possibilities of appearing as something which you are not. That Brahman, with his intrinsic power, can appear as an ignorant jiva. But the possibility of you waking up from the dream and 
discovering your true accountant nature and the better possibility exists or not. Here also, the possibility of waking up from this jivahood into Ishwarahood, that possibility exists. Only problem with us is we get so enamored by the things of the world, we forget Ishwara and all. First you give me that watch. We say, first you give me this thing, give me that thing, I want this thing, I want that thing. We get so attached to this world that we don't use, utilize the possibility of realizing our own self. So, in brief, to answer your question, the, the source of that ignorance is the Maya of God. And what is the Maya of God? The Maya is his intrinsic power to manifest as anything. One of which is an ignorant state in which we are existing. And, this, and since it, the possibilities are infinite, well, Bhagavan is wonderful. You don't have to stay in this, but we choose to stay. Yes? We still have, well, my watch has 15 minutes. Yes. Hey, eight minutes, he'll bring that. Hari Om Swamiji. Hari Om. You said when you are doing japa and our mind goes all over, how to focus, how to concentrate, mm -hmm. that mind should not go when we are doing japa, mind should not go here and there. Good question. Yeah. This is not a very practical thing. Japa is classified as three types. One is called as Uccha Japa. The second one is called as Manda Japa. And the third one is called as Chitta Jam Japa. What is the meaning of that? Uccha Japa means I chant loudly. Chant as loud as you want, even if the neighbor hears. Hmm? Then Manda Japa means I chant softly. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Only I'm hearing. In the next room also nobody could hear. Eh? But I'm still using this vak. Vaikari it is called. And Chitta Jam Japa means Japa in the mind. So if the mind has become very agitated on any particular day, you keep moving to a grosser level. Eh? So if you're trying to do Japa in the mind and it's very agitated, you come to the, the Manda Japa uh, where you can hear. Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. And if that also is still not working, then you go to loud, you see? So you have these levels. And every day your mind will be different. It will not be the same. So you choose which one and see. Now, sometimes even that, you know, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, neighbor could hear. Sometimes even that doesn't work. Then what you do, then you have to do stuti, stavanam. Stavanam means you chant, you know, how Hanuman Jalisa, or you chant some stava, stuti, some, something like that. Shri Ramachandra Kipalu Bhajumana. Then you come back to Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Then you go to soft, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Then you go to... So you see which one is working for you on which particular day, because every day you will not have the same type of situation in your work and your environment also, you know. So when you sit there, see which one works. So I tell you four levels then. Chitta Jam inside, soft, only you can hear. Loud, the neighbor could hear. And then if that doesn't work, chant some stuti, some other thing that you know. There are so many stutis are there. Okay, if that is the end, then the Ribji will. Ah, uh, here. Hi, how are you? Um, you mentioned in Bhakti Yoga that if you have two conflicting realities, that um, you need to come back to one. So, for example, a conflicting reality might be, I want to make a lot of money, but I don't want to pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> right? How do, and how do I come back to that one reality? In our shastras also, besides the yogas which are given, say karma yoga, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, in the shastras there is something which is called, which is very important, that thing is called a dharma. Dharma. So dharma doesn't conflict with karma yoga, bhakti yoga or jnana yoga. Dharma is a requirement that everybody has to follow 
in order that I may practice my karma yoga well, I may practice my bhakti yoga well, I may practice my jnana yoga well. I have to be following dharma also. And dharma means that which holds a universe together. And in the case of a country, that which holds the country together, which holds the society together, which holds the family together. So societies are built on dharmic principles, but people may not follow and they may do everything to break those principles and all that kind, that's a different matter. But societies are formed on dharmic principles, right? And so like, for example, now, if the government has to build roads and the government has to put up infrastructure for this and that, and all, they have to get money from somewhere. So the society is built in such a way that we can collect taxes from everybody and build the roads, so that, uh, build the infrastructure so the whole country can benefit from that. So this is not something which is bad or which is designed to bring um, pain to the people and all that kind of thing. People have to realize also that if, if I'm partaking of the goodies of the society, I also have to give something. So if the person is following dharma, then no such conflict will, will come. It is only when I relinquish dharma then all such conflicts come. One has to be very clear about what is dharma. And this is why Shastras talk so much of them. Arjuna himself is telling Bhagavan, dharma samura chetaha. I am confused about dharma. Means what is the proper, righteous, correct thing to do under the situation? So I have to, now suppose I cannot figure it out, then ask somebody in authority, those who can figure it out. It is essential that all people pay taxes in today's, today's type of society. Where was our money? How do you get running water and all the nice highways and all things that we, that we enjoy? It is essential that everybody pay taxes. It's a dharmic principle it's for the greater good of all together. Dharma is always concerned about the greatest good for the greatest number. Now, that quite apart from what actually happens, eh? because when they collect the taxes and all the corruption and this and that, that's a different matter. They are not following dharma. That's a, I'm not talking about that. That's a different topic. All right. So whenever there's any conflict in the mind as to which course of action to take, one has to resolve that only through dharma. Dharma is also a utilitarian principle. The greatest good for the greatest number. Yes. Anyone else? Probably just have time for one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. After that, I will just make a couple announcements, Devaji. Yeah, sure. Then you can do some closing. I have a few things I just want to invite people to. Hari Om Swamiji. In some part of the lecture, you mentioned that like when we wake up in the morning, we will look at the TV or the or no one get carried away. Um, be, I am a housewife, and being a housewife, you're always hearing all this crime taking place everywhere. How could you keep your mind focused and not let everyday happening affect your daily lives? Mm. You know, you always have to look out for bandits every day. Yes. They're coming out in the night here, you're worrying if you get back safe. Yeah. Every, that is a very good question. That's a quite, quite current thing which is going on. Everybody is asking the same question. I'll tell you something. Huh? Um, there are some. There's a story about Swami Vivekananda. Now, I, I don't think it is a true story, but somebody must have made it up with some purpose. It is said that Swami Vivekananda was uh, standing one day giving a talk, and somebody fire a bullet and the whole crowd went helter skelter, ran everywhere in every direction. And Swamiji just stood there without moving. And at the end of the whole fiasco and everything, everybody came back and they asked, I told you, I don't know if it's a true story, but it's made up with a purpose. He said, they, they said to Swamiji, well, how come everybody was so scared and they ran here, ran there, and you just stood there with, and Swamiji said a very nice thing. And that is, if that bullet was meant for me, it would have never mi missed me. And if it is not, um, if it was meant for me, it would have never missed me. Surely it would have struck me. And if it was not meant for me, it cannot touch me. 
And this is a 100% reliance on the law of karma. So now there are two aspects to this. Eh? You know, in the Arabian saying, what is that? Have faith in God, but first tie your camel. You heard that? So there are always two aspects. Karma yoga is karma yoga is not to be taken as fatalistic and all that. Not, not karma yoga, karma. Not to be taken as fatalistic. I accept 100% the law of karma. If there is some, in fact, if all of us are suffering this the pangs of the crime situation in Trinidad, it is because of our own karma. You see, Bhagwan will not subject us to something for which we did not have some karma in the past. Right? So, first of all, to accept the law of karma 100%. Karma Pradhan Bishwakari Rakha. Jo Jasa Kare Sutas Palu Chakha. We'll get only our own karma. Accepting. No. If I am living in, a, in the 21st century, 2000, uh, in, in 2018, uh, in this time, where the rules of the game is I have to keep what, looking over my shoulder and I have to take this precaution and take that precaution, but that is the time in which you are living. You have to also. Do it. So there are two things. One is the 100% acceptance of the law of karma and do the things which are required of you in 2018 which is governed by the environment in which you are living. That those are the two things. Now, if we accept the law of karma 100%, that will bring great peace of mind. Because if something is going to happen to me, it is going to happen no matter what. If it is not going to happen, it is not going to happen. So I accept this law of karma, which is just strongly there in our shastras. And when it is time for me to go, nobody can stop. If it's time to go, I have to go. And the other thing is, the society requires of me in this time to take certain precautions. That also becomes my duty. So I do it. I have to take care. You, know, become, you can't say, no, no, if I have to die, I will die. Let me walk out on the highway. Anyway, we're not talking about <laughs> We're not like that. We're not talking about that thing. On a highway, you're supposed to take precaution or not? Do what is required of you in that time and that place and accept the law of karma 100. This is the solution. Uh -huh. What about other things? Shouldn't we go and, uh, uh, what do you call it, protest and picket and... Uh, if you think that you can affect policies and bring about change, that also is part of your duty. Hmm? It becomes part of your duty also. Okay. Now, before Devabji gives the closing remark, let me just invite you to a couple of things. We have a, a concert coming up next month, a very, very famous and world-renowned flautist, one who plays flute. His name is Pandit Ronu Majumdar. He's coming to the ashram on the 27th of July. Um, he is also made it into Guinness Book of Records. Uh, also received President Medal and he's a very, very well known. He's played for Bollywood and also he's a very famous Ronu Majumdar Pandit. He's coming on the 27th of July at the ashram. If you can make it, you please do come. We have summer classes for children. It's, this year it's called Selfie to Self. You know, Selfie is very popular these days, you know. Selfie to Self. You bring your children, please tell others also, in the morning at 8 o'clock and pick them up at 4 o'clock in the evening. Uh, it starts on, uh, first of all, the ages are 8 to 18, and it starts on the 23rd of July and goes to the 17th of August. All right? And at the end of August, we have at the ashram our International Vegetarian Food Fair. Last, we, we always aim for 108 different dishes. We end up last time, or some time before, with 167 different dishes, of which I make quite a few also. And I see that you are still alive so that you can come and try again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. A very special head you to Pandit Parashram who has joined us here tonight also. In the beginning, I did not recognize anybody, but sorry about that, Pandit. I'm not in the habit of doing that means to say, my last life, I wasn't a politician. Dear <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Um, we just have uh, two small items again before we close. And, um, but before we go into it, I, um, I hope that, um, you know, everyone has, um, well, intellectually enjoyed, emotionally enjoyed <laughs> um, Swamiji's um, discourse here today. I, Swamiji, we deliberately chose the topic because, um, you know, sometimes we, you know, we, we tend to, to look at scripture just from a point of view of, you know, reading it for blessings and all of these things. And, uh, you know, with Bhagavad Gita, um, <clears throat> the fact that um, the crisis of Arjuna brought about that dialogue and the entire thing was framed in yoga, reference to yoga. Yeah. You know, um, we are indeed um, blessed to hear your views on it and your thoughts on it. And I'm sure everyone here would have appreciated. Um, you know, it's, uh, in a way it's good and then in a way it's ironic about the whole movement of yoga in the world right now. <clears throat> and the wisdom of, of the, the movement to have it as an international day of yoga without branding and say, International Day of Hinduism, but effectively it is Hindu thought, Hindu culture, practice um, being disseminated into the everyday life of persons. And um, this is what um, the Gita brings to us, the opportunity for all of the yogas to be integrated with how we live. Even our heart, you know, if that's our strong point, great, there's our yoga there. Our intellect, yes, our yoga there. And in all actions, everything we do with our lives could be translated into yoga based on how it is approached. Yeah. And then another thing is, all of it is being appropriated and repackaged. Um, in a way, it's good. It, it reaches um, a lot of persons who have um, hang ups about religion and all of those things. You know, but um, the latest in the American, um, the Western psychology, and therapy is mindfulness, you know, and you spoke about the yoga, the mind, and uh, through yoga, the management of the mind. Uh, before that, it was about emotional wellness, and again, it touches the heart. So, the whole thing has been taken, and it has been repackaged, and, and I think it's, in a, in a way, it's very good. Yeah. The only negative thing, I think, is when... Um, we refuse to acknowledge the root and the source of all this information and knowledge. So, um, one thing I should mention, the International Day of the Yoga Committee. You know, we are getting out of the Kumkaran effect, <laughs> where we go to sleep after the International Day of Yoga, to rise up back, <laughs> wake up back uh, the following year. So, we are looking to embark on a um, quarterly outreach program and what the committee is looking at is to have outreach programs in different areas of Trinidad. And we will be exploring with the yoga charyas um, a practical, simple module of yoga practice that would help persons who <coughs> suffer with diabetes and cardiac related diseases. A lot of research is being done, and you hear all sorts of things, so we are going to try to distill something that we could take to the public to address these uh, chronic diseases that are so prevalent in our society from a practical point of view. So um, I'd just like to call on um, a member of the committee, um, Srimati Diane Singh, who is also a member of the Yoga Meditation Society. Uh, one of the member organizations of the committee to just do a small presentation to you, Swamiji. The fruits of no labor.
And we'll also ask Diane to just do our vote of thanks. Namaste, Hariyom. It is an honor and privilege to extend a vote of thanks on behalf of, of the International Day of Yoga Committee. <clears throat> the discourse tonight marks the last of three events celebrating International Day of Yoga 2018. <clears throat> excuse me. First and foremost, I say special thanks to Reverend Puj <clears throat> Pujaya Prakashanandaji of the Chinmaya Mission for shedding light and wisdom on the topics of yoga and the Bhagavad Gita. Thank you. You know, just for information, <clears throat> a few years ago, I was asked to write something on what is yoga. So I asked our yoga charya, Alex Bai, Alexander Benjamin, what is yoga? And he said, yoga is samadhi. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the control of the modifications of the mind field. And I was like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, um, yoga has nothing to do with asanas. And that's the first thing you said. And um, so I said, what, what do you mean? What I've been doing and teaching and practicing is wrong? He said, no, it's not wrong, but you have a Western mind. <laughs> So, Swamiji, I'm still dismantling this Western mind and wrapping my mind around what yoga really is. But it was indeed a delightful, it was indeed delightful to sit and listen to your divine discourse flavored with humor and practical philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita. We are also grateful to His Excellency, Mr. Biswadeep D, the High Commissioner of India to Trinidad, for his support and collaboration in bringing these events to a successful conclusion. Thank you. Heartfelt thank you to the NCIC for the use of these premises and for organizing the venue for these two events today. Thank you, Mr. Vikash Rampal, for the use of the song system at both functions today. And thank you, Vivek, for your double role as being secretary and uh, taking the photography for today. And to all other individuals and organizations who supported any of the events, we are indeed grateful for your input. And on behalf of my own organization, YMSTT, it would be remiss of me if I didn't take this opportunity to recognize the contribution of both the High Commissioner of India and the International Day of Yoga Committee for promoting YMSTT main event 108 Surya Namaskar, which took place this morning at the Diwali Nagar. Like yoga on the boardwalk, this year it was quite a success, our unfeeling gratitude. Special gratitude to Mr. Deorup Timal for his vision and foresight in recognizing and encompassing not only the physical but the spiritual aspects of yoga as is evident by planning and execution of this discourse tonight by our ever ever vessels, Swamiji. Thank you. And finally, your presence here tonight, brave in the inclement weather, has guaranteed additional success to tonight's event. Thank you and thank you all. Namaste. Please, we have some refreshments as you leave, but don't rush off, meet each other, discuss a little bit. Unfortunately, it's not a buffet. <laughs> 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 it's just something to keep you going until you reach home. Namaskar to all. <laughs>